3 this morning. 1 John chapter 3. We're looking at two verses in 1 John chapter 3. It's verse 11, verse 23. Before we get started, spiritual breathing this morning. Y'all know the drill by now. I don't see any of y'all that's new enough that you wouldn't know. So uh, let's let all that junk out. Let's get rid of it this morning. If whatever's hindering you from being ministered to by God, let's let it loose this morning. Ask God to fill that with His perfect Holy Spirit. Ask God's love to envelop you, to overcome you, to do away with any of that stuff that might be hindering you this morning, that might be holding you back. Before I get started in, in this morning's sermon, I wanted to share with you some interesting facts about Valentine's Day. In Victorian times, it was considered bad luck to sign a Valentine's Day card. Based on retail statistics, about 3% of pet owners will give Valentine's gifts to their pets. How many did you buy for our pet, Cheryl? None. Oh, that's amazing. She's also a statistic. Oh. About 1 million Valentine's Day cards are exchanged each year. This makes it the second largest seasonal card sending time of the year. Many believe the X symbol becomes synonymous with the kiss in medieval times. People who couldn't write their names signed in front of a witness with an X. The X was then kissed to show their sincerity. In the Middle Ages, young men and women drew names from a bowl to see who would be their Valentine. They would express this name they would wear this name pinned onto their sleeve for one week for everyone to see. This was the origin of the expression, to wear your heart on your sleeve. In 1537, England's King Henry VII officially declared February the 14th the holiday of St. Valentine's Day. Physicians of the 1800s commonly advised their patients to eat chocolate to calm their pining for lost love. Well, that was <laughs> There were some good doctors to eat chocolate. I like them guys. Uh, Richard Cadbury produced the first box of chocolates for Valentine's Day in the late 1800s. More than 35 million heart-shaped boxes of chocolate will be sold for Valentine's Day. 73% of people who buy flowers for Valentine's Day are men, while only 27% are women. But 15% of U.S. women will send themselves flowers on Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, only one, over $1 billion worth of chocolate is purchased for Valentine's Day in the U.S. Over 50% of all Valentine's Day cards are purchased in the six days prior to the holiday, making Valentine's Day a procrastinator's delight. Y'all remind me when I leave here to go get my wife something for Valentine's today. <laughs> Speaking of procrastination. Uh, the red rose was the favorite flower of Venus, the Roman goddess of love. Red roses are considered the flower of love because the color red stands for strong romantic feelings. 189 million stem, stems of roses are sold in the U.S. on Valentine's Day. I'm going to stop right there and interject something. I do not buy my wife flowers on Valentine's Day because I ain't paying twice the price. I'm going to buy them for the rest of the year when they're cheap. And I think she appreciates that because she, she's cheap like I am. So. Uh, Thank you, baby. Uh, women purchase approximately 85% of all Valentine's Day gifts. Teachers will receive the most Valentine's Day cards, followed by children, mothers, wives, sweethearts, and pets. Again, I'm not sure why a pet needs a Valentine's Day card, but all right. 220,000 is the average number of wedding proposals on Valentine's Day each year. I just thought some of them were kind of interesting facts on Valentine's Day. You know, it's... It's like a lot of things in America. It's become commercialized. It's become, you know, love, love's not even, love's kind of a commercialized thing. And, and I'm going to get preached on that in a minute. But uh, <clears throat> Valentine's Day has become very commercialized. But it doesn't hurt to stop and celebrate our love every now and then. It doesn't hurt to take a special day out just to say, you know what, I love that person or I love my spouse or whoever that special someone is in your life. I love my pet. 
and I'm going to give them a Valentine's Day today. So it doesn't hurt to take a special day out. Go to be in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 and 23. There's two verses. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then in verse 23 it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Father, we love you and praise you, Lord. Thank you so much for this day. And Father, I pray at this time I can decrease, you'll increase, Lord. Hide me behind your cross. Father, I pray your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds of each and every one of us for the word that you have for us here today, Lord. Father, I pray that you'll just bind Satan and loose your spirit on this little group of people who you love. In Jesus' name. Was it? I believe it was Tina Turner that wrote a song back in the 80s that said, What's love got to do with it? And the chorus of that song said, Oh, what's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? This whole song portrays love as an emotion. Now, the definition of emotion is, is a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. So with that being said, with the whole definition of emotions in place, it stands to reason that emotions can come and go. Emotions can be here one minute. Emotions can be gone the next. Emotions come and go. We all know this. We all experience emotions. We all know that emotions come and go. You know, one minute you're sad, one minute you're happy, one minute you're you're mad one the other minute you're elated you know we're emotions come and go and that makes sense with our society today when we look at our society and whole it makes sense especially when it comes to love society says I don't love you anymore so it's time to move on society says I used to love you but I don't anymore <coughs> society says my love for you has so dwindled away over the years. These are the things society has taught us. These are the norms for our society today, the culture we live in, that loves just a, a passing emotion, that loves just something that's there. It might stay around a little while. It might not. And the sad part is that the church has, has started to adapt these views as well. They've started to adapt the, the society norm out there because the divorce rate in churches are just as high as they are out in the world. So the church has evidently started adapting to some of these things. Anytime the church doesn't stand apart from the world, it's time to raise a red flag. Amen? Amen. It's time to raise a flag. When the church just blends in with the world, it's time to say something ain't quite right here. Because Jesus said we're to be in this world, but not of this world. We're not, to, we're not to be chameleons in this world just to blend in and be a part of it. We're to stand out. He calls us a peculiar people, a set-apart people. So what does love got to do with it from a biblical standpoint? What, what, if Tina Turner was singing her song from a biblical standpoint, what would be the answer to her question? How about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Or how about John 15, 13? Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Ain't you glad that God didn't just go through an emotion with His love? Aren't you glad it just weren't a fleeting emotion that come one day and went away with God? Ain't you glad that he didn't say, I don't think I love the world anymore, so no more Jesus for you. <laughs> hey, I'm pulling back my grace car. You don't get grace today. No more. No more grace for you. Because that, that, that emotion's gone, so I want my grace back. I, I'm withdrawing from this situation. Ain't you glad that ain't what God said? I'm just withdrawing from this situation. After all, what have you done to deserve it? I mean, God would be justified if he said that. He'd be justified to say, hey, according to the world's standards, he would be justified to say, you ain't done nothing to justify my love, to deserve my love, so I'm taking it back. I'm done with it. 
That emotion's gone. I don't love you anymore. Would he not? Yes. By the world's standards, he would. But God don't love like that. God does not love us like that. So it brings up the questions, how are we as Christians supposed to love? We're supposed to love like God does. And we're going to talk about three ways that we can love this morning. One is unconditionally. We are to love unconditionally. As Christians, we are to love unconditionally. Romans 5, 7 and 8 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we tend to put conditions on love. I'll love you, but... You know, we always put that but in there. I'll love you, but... you got to do this. you got to do that. You know, and even the churches, we put conditions on love. You know, come join our fellowship and we'll love you as long as, you know... You dress right, you fit the part, you do this, you do that. You know, we, the church, I'm not talking about Eastside, I think y'all are very great at this. But the church in general has put conditions on it. You know, you come join us and you come be a part of us as long as, or but, you know, we always got to put that, put that clause in there to protect ourselves or anything. And we put conditions on our marriages. I love you as long as. You love me. I'll love you as long as you are faithful. I'll love you as long as whatever the circumstances might be. We put, we put them, we put them conditions on our marriages. A lot of times, subconsciously, we have put them loves, love on them marriages. I'll get you out in a minute. We put conditions on our marriages. We forget the vows we made, for better or worse, and in sickness and in health, till death do us part. You know, we made vows. I, I know when I married Cheryl, I made vows. I said, for, de uh, for better or worse, that means in the good times and in the bad times, in sickness and in health. That means i got to love her through. If she gets down where she can't take care of herself, i still got to love her. i still got to be there with her. You know, till death do we part. I am bound with her. Till death do we part. And there was one other one that she don't take too seriously. I'm pretty sure when Ray Cotton married us, he said that she would honor and obey. But she, she disagrees with me on that. She says Ray didn't say that. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I better listen to her and go with her on that. But, uh, God calls yeah, would be, would God calls us to love people as they are. You know, that's, that's not easy. That's not easy to love people as they are. This means you've got to love them even when you don't like them. You know, I, I've been recently, just recently, I've been tested here. I've been tested in this area. Somebody I just don't like. I mean, I, I'm just being honest with y'all. I don't like them. But God has put it on my heart that I have to love him. And you know how hard that is? That means you might have to spend a little time in them, invest in them a little bit. You know how hard it is to do that with somebody you don't even like? You know, yeah, it is. But it's unconditional love. We've got to love them unconditionally. How about if God didn't like me? I'm sure there's things that I do that God don't like. I'm sure there's ways that I act that just irritate the mess out of God. What if He put them conditions on me, though? I wouldn't want that. We've got to love each other unconditionally. We have to pray that God will do a work in these people's lives. We have to invest in them a little bit. Pray that God will, will do a work in their lives. We can't change them. We can't change any of these people. But He can. Any of y'all that's been around me long enough, I, I, I get asked as a pastor, how, how do you deal with some of these circumstances? How do you deal with some of the people that you deal with? And my answer is, the thing that I live by, people's going to be people, and you got to love them in spite of themselves. I mean, that, that's the thing that keeps me going. Because if I got caught hung up on what so-and-so said or what so-and-so did or, or how I got treated or how this one got treated, boy, I'd spend all my time harboring bitterness and hate, and I would spend all my time letting this stuff 
what, you know, just grow inside of me. And what I would figure out and what would eventually happen is I'd find out the only person that I've harmed through all this is myself. We gotta love people unconditionally. We also gotta love people sacrificially. 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We can't just tell the world of God's love. We have to show them. We have to show people sometimes, you know. Hey, I, I could spend my whole marriage telling Cheryl how much I loved her, but if I don't do something to show her, if I don't show her some kind of affection, if I don't do something to kind of show her my love, she's not going to believe it. She's going to say that's lip service. You know, lip service is easy. But actually following through with it to show people the love, to love sacrificially, that's something different. Sometimes this means feeding the hungry. You know, going out there and feeding the hungry. Sometimes it means clothing the less fortunate, taking a day off and sewing dresses over here for people that you don't even know slam across the world. Sometimes that's what that means, to love sacrificially. You know, sometimes it just means investing a little time in people. Just spending a little, I know some people in here that, I don't envy them because they invest a lot of time in a lot of people that they don't get any credit or accolades for. They just do it. They spend a lot of time ministering and don't even sometimes, I think sometimes they don't even realize they are ministering. They're just doing what they feel led to do. We have to show people that God loves them through our deeds, through our actions. You know, it's called walking the walk is what it's called. It's easy to talk the talk. It's easy to provide that lip service. But walking the walk is a totally different thing. We have to love sacrificially. We have to show people that we actually love. Too many Christians get their fill on Sunday and that's it. You know, we walk around, we get our cup filled up on Sunday and that's it. We walk around just sloshing around a little bit. Our cup sloshing a little bit might pour out here. A little bit might land on the carpet. You know, you don't know where it's going to go. And what we ought to do is when we get our cup filled, we ought to be pouring out into somebody else helping to fill their cup. And God will continue to fill our cup. We ought to be pouring out into others, being sacrificial, showing others, loving others, investing in others. I talked last week. I talked about being a light. Being a light. And sometimes we need to let them feel the heat off the light. They ne we need to let them get close enough. We need to get close enough to them that they'll feel, feel the heat off that light. And the third thing is we've got to love personally. We've got to love personally. 1 John 4, 20 through 21 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Uh-oh. Did John just really say what I think John just said here? He says, if I love, say I love God but hate my brother, I'm a liar. I'm pretty sure that's what that just said. That's pretty tough words. How many times do you hear that, though? Boy, I love the Lord. But that old sister Sally, or sister so-and-so, or whoever, they can go suck a lemon or something. I ain't got no use for them. You know, or, or, or one of my favorites, I love the Lord, but I sure don't care nothing about His church. Yeah, well, yeah. I need to show you what 1 John 4, 20 and 21 says. Look at that last part of verse 21. That he who loves God must love his brother also. He didn't say, he didn't put multiple choice in there. He didn't put a fill in the blank like we had when we was in school. He filled it out for you. He said you must 
love your brother. Must. That's pretty direct. That don't leave a whole lot to play with there. That don't give you no choice. He says must. You've got to love your brother. There ain't no choice in there. God don't, don't say if you want to love him. He don't say if you feel like loving him today. He don't say you must love your brother, but he says you must love your brother. Remember that old adage? I, I know all of y'all's heard it. We might be the only Jesus some people ever see. We might be the only Bible some people ever read. There's a lot of truth in those things. There's a lot of truth in those little sayings. If we don't love each other, how do we ever think we can emanate God's love in the world? If we don't love each other, how are we supposed to get out and show the world the love of God? If we're in here fighting and fussing amongst ourselves, hating each other, don't care nothing about each other, like so many churches you see out there today, how do we get out there and eliminate the love of God? Our problems, we're people, we're going to have problems in our churches. We're going to have problems amongst each other. We need to work them out amongst each other. We don't need to take any of our problems out in the world. We don't need to share with lost folks the things that we have in here. We sure don't need to go complain to them. They need to see the love of Christ. They need to see our willingness to work through our problems. They need to see our willingness to love each other unconditionally in spite of each other. To love it, to sacrifice. You know, maybe, maybe I'm maybe I am right and you are wrong. But maybe that means me saying. I'm sorry anyway. Maybe it means me sacrificing a little bit of my pride and being humble about things. Maybe that means that sometimes. We've got to love each other if we're ever going to emanate that love into the world. And it starts right here. It starts right here. And you know, the, here's the order it must go. Here's the order our love must go. We must love God first. We gotta love him above all of it. He said, Jesus said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul. This is the first and greatest commandment. We gotta love our spouse. Our spouse is next. We gotta love our spouse. When we love God and we get our our relation when both both parties get their relationship with God right, the marriage ain't near as difficult. The relationship ain't near as difficult. And we've got to love our children. Now, some people might say, well, you put your children above your spouse. The Bible never said, honor thy children. Never does it say, honor thy children. It says, honor thy mother and thy father. The, the husband and wife come first to the children. I, I'm not demeaning the children. I'm not demeaning the relationship between a child and a parent because there is something special there by all means. But the reality of it is, one day your children will grow up and start families of their own and it's going to be you and your spouse again. You're always going to have the children but they're going to be off and they're going to start a family of their own and your family is going to be back to what it started. You, God, and your spouse. You love them children and you take care of them children. I don't want none of y'all to get me wrong in this but your spouse, you couldn't have created them children without your spouse. The two of you together created that and your brethren your brothers and sisters in Christ they ought to be next you, know, you love them and when we get all that right it is natural when we start getting our relationships with God our relationship with our spouse our relationship with our children when we in our relationship with our brethren right it will naturally start overflowing into the world It'll start pouring out into the world. It just naturally happens. Yeah, it'll just start overflowing into the world. So, so how do I apply this to Valentine's Day? How do I apply it to my spouse? You love you. You love them unconditionally. And you know there's some folks here that sing. <clears throat> but one day you might be married. And these are things to take heed of. These are things to... to to realize, you know, marriage is not an easy thing. So there's 
We talked about it in Sunday school some today. Yep. Too many people go in with these Cinderella dreams of marriage, you know, and the reality is marriage is tough. Marriage brings about a lot of difficulties. But if you love your spouse unconditionally, even when they don't deserve it, Lord knows I don't deserve it all the time, and Cheryl, for some reason, loves me anyway. And it works the other way, too. She don't always deserve it, but I love her anyway. She's saying, yeah, I do. I deserve it all the time. Uh, you love him sacrificially. You know, sometimes it means giving up some things you, you didn't mean giving up. You didn't want to give up. Sometimes it means putting them above you, putting your spouse first. And you love them personally. You gotta let your spouse see the Jesus in you. You gotta let your spouse. You know, it, it's easy. It, it is easy to come in here on Sunday mornings and, and emanate this perfect persona as a Christian. You know, oh, you know, I'm all this and then some. <clears throat> You know, it's easy for us to do that. Where it becomes hard is with the person you're with all the time, with your spouse, <clears throat> with your family, with your children. That's where it gets hard. Because it's easy once you get away from here to let go and to let things kind of, you know, let your guard down. You know, we come in here and we automatically got walls built up. And we're making sure when you get with your spouse, and boy, I'm, I'm not sitting up, I'm not sitting up here condemning anybody because I am the world's worst sometimes. The preacher ain't perfect. I'm telling y'all, he is not perfect. You don't believe it? We'll get Cheryl to preach him one day. I'm not perfect. There ain't no preacher out there that's perfect. We probably struggle more than most of y'all do, truth be known, because we do have some responsibilities. We have responsibilities here and all, and they can be overwhelming. And sometimes we neglect our families. But we all have that responsibility. We got to love them personally. We got to let them, your spouse, see the Jesus in you. Ephesians 5 22 through 29 says, Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, that's a mouthful right there. But that's pretty much what Paul's got to say to the wives. Then he starts getting on the husbands. And he's got a lot more to say to the husbands than he does the wives. So he goes on to say, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his bodies, of his flesh, and of his bones. Honeymoon sometimes, yeah. Honeymoon's over, and it, and it's it's easy to be callous to one another. So my challenge for you this week is to emanate, start right here, emanate the love of Christ in your own homes. Make a conscious effort this week to emanate the love of Christ, starting in your homes starting right there in your homes. And watch it. Watch it what happens. It'll overflow into your church. It'll overflow right here in the church. And, and then watch that flow out into the community. When we start building it at home, it starts naturally overflowing. It'll overflow into our church. And when we start getting it in our church, it'll start naturally overflowing into our community. Show me a church where there is love, and I'll show you a church that is a, is a power in the community. In Chicago a few years ago, a bo little boy attended a Sunday school I know of. 
When his parents moved to another part of the city, the little fellow still attended the same Sunday school, although it meant a long, tiresome walk each way. A friend asked him why he went so far, and he told him there were plenty of others just as good nearer to his home. They may be as good for others, but not for me, was his reply. Why not, she asked. Because they love a fellow over there, he replied. If only we could make the world believe that we love them, there would be few empty, fewer empty churches and a smaller proportion of our population who never darken a church door. Let love replace duty in our church relations, and the world will soon be evangelized. And that's by D.L. Moody. Moody. I like the thing that struck out that little story to me was let love replace duty. Let love replace duty in the church. It's easy to get caught up in duty, you know. I've got duties to do. We've got deacons here that have duties to do at the church. We've got ladies that do a lot of duties here at the church. And it's easy for those just to become duties. Let love replace the duties that we have at the church. Don't let them just be merely duties. Let them be done out of love. Let love replace duties. You can just chew on that for a while. Let love replace your duties at the church, whatever your duties might be. Back to the original question. Back to the Tina Turner song. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us. As Tanil comes up and plays, <clears throat> God loved us so much. I've shared this before. We talk about heaven and we talk about getting there and how beautiful and how grand it's going to be. How majestic everything's going to be. We talk about a street of gold. We talk about, you know, all the glory that's going to be in heaven. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's truth in that. But think about this for a minute. The place you strive to go, this place of ultimate utopia or whatever you want to call it, the God of the universe loved you enough that He left that place to come down to the sin-ridden earth so that He might make a way for you. To pay a debt he didn't know. He come down to earth to go to that cross of Calvary. You tell me what love's got to do with it. There's a little thing that's I've seen around for years. Said that somebody asked, God, how much do you love me? He loved you so much. One nail stretched hand to the other. He stretched out his hands and died for you. That's how much he loved for you. That's an awesome thought, man. The God of the universe, the one that spoke this universe into existence, the one who's in control of eight billion people down here on this planet that can calm the winds, winds that can make the seas roar if he wants to. Desires to have an ultimate, desires to have a personal relationship with you. The God of the universe wants to know you one on one. That's the Lord. That's the Lord. If you're here today and you need to be at this altar, I urge you to come up. <clears throat> if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never experienced what real love is, what God's love is, please come forward. Don't leave here today. But if you just need to come up here and say, Lord, happy Valentine's. I love you, Lord. 